Tonight, we have three experts with us on the topic of storytelling and education. The first is Anne Grin Saldinger, who's director of the Oral History Project at the Holocaust Center of Northern California. She holds a PhD in clinical psychology from the Wright Institute in Berkeley and has extensively researched the psychological effects of telling one's story for Holocaust survivors. Drawing on her research and her experience interviewing hundreds of survivors, Dr. Saldinger has presented numerous papers at international conferences on the significance of Holocaust testimony. She has also incorporated oral history excerpts in her book, Life in a Nazi Concentration Camp, published by Lucent Books. Perry Shinock is a Holocaust survivor and member of the Holocaust Center of Northern California Survivor Speakers Bureau. Mr. Shinock speaks to students and community groups about his family's harrowing experiences during the Holocaust, which shook them from the hog through occupied Vichy France and ultimately to freedom in the United States. It is an extraordinary story. Mr. Shinock is also a prolific writer, reflecting on both his experiences during the Holocaust and other topics. And as we found out yesterday, we go to the same shul. <clears throat> Susan Gluck Rothenberg is currently an affiliated scholar in the history department of Kenyon College in Gambier, Ohio. Ms. Rothenberg was educated at Hunter College and the University of Chicago, where she earned an MSW from the School of Social Service Administration. She's used her training as a psychiatric social worker with a variety of populations. Recently, she has found a new niche in helping elders record their life experiences and editing those remembrances into a coherent tale, leaving their families and friends with far more than just a chronology of their lives. She worked with Johnny Wilson Jr. on his memoir, To Be a Man, which is anthologized in the book, My Words Are Gonna Linger, The Art of Personal History. The format for our evening is the following. We will first play a very brief clip that uh, comes from, from StoryCorps, interview with Debbie Fisher from, New York, from StoryCorps New York studio. After that, Anne Grant Saldinger will offer some thoughts, a kind of a educational or pedagogical base, talking about some of the ideas under discussion. After we have that um, to digest a little bit, then uh, the four of us will sit and have a conversation about some of the issues. And we want to make sure that we have time afterwards for you to ask questions and participate in the conversation. Our museum store is staying open late, so we'll be able to sell some of the books and um, sign some of the books. And anything else you feel like buying in there would be greatly appreciated. All right, so let's play our clip. My father was a Holocaust survivor. He had survived the same camp as Elie Wiesel. They were both the same age. And when my dad was alive and through school, I was reading Night. And I was 14 years old when I was reading it, but I had no idea that the Auschwitz that Wiesel was writing about, where he lived for a year, was the same one that my father lived in, because my father's Auschwitz was a kinder, gentler Auschwitz. It was sort of like Robin Hood and his merry men meet the Nazis in my father's Auschwitz. There was never a moment where people were dying in front of him. The worst happened the first night, then they killed his siblings and they killed his parents. And then from that moment on, the boys took over. And that was the story we were given. But when he was very, very sick in the hospital and I knew I was uh, losing him, I realized that there was no going back and that if I didn't make my move, I could not return to the moment of having access to his memories. And this time he was really tired and he wasn't feeling well. And I said, I need to ask you about your time there, in Auschwitz. I need to ask you some things, Dad. It's important. And I remember he looked at me, and he had real anger in his face and in his eyes. He said, you know, Debbie, from the time that you were a young girl, you always asked your questions. And I always told you, we got food, we got bread, we divided it up, we didn't suffer. It was fine. And you keep bothering me and asking me the question. And I keep telling you, as if I'm in a room, go away. Stop knocking on the door. I do not want to let you in this room. And yet you keep coming back saying, let me in. And he said, so I'll ask you one more time to go away. And if you knock again, I'll let you in. But if I let you in this room, you will never, ever get out. So do you want to knock again and come in? And I said, yes, I do, Dad. And he was crying. And I remember he had covers on his body because he was really skinny and very, very weak. And he kicked all the covers off as if he was kicking down a door. And he said, fine, come in then. Come into a room that you can never leave. Come in. And then I said, can I, can I ask you my questions? He said, you're in the room. You can ask anything. And I asked him everything that I ever wanted to ask. I asked him to tell me the real story. 
and he did. It was painful and scary and sickening. I felt a part of me had died. And he's right. Once you're in that room, you can't get out. It's always with you. Um, please welcome Anne Grand Saldinger. It's a powerful clip, and I'm sure people will want to respond to it. I welcome this opportunity to be here at the Contemporary Jewish Museum to speak together uh, about how we will continue to engage in Holocaust remembrance in the 21st century. And the presence of StoryCorps here, I think, makes it especially fitting to talk about how and why oral history is such an important part of this discussion. As we attempt to understand and remember the post-Holocaust generation and beyond, we face the ever-present challenges of confronting the limits of our understanding. We face the questions of how various texts and expressive medium represent the Holocaust and how we can affect some level of understanding. Despite the impossibility of imagining the unimaginable and the difficulties of finding a language to tell the story of the Holocaust, the telling itself is essential. We endeavor to understand and remember in numerous ways, all of them significant and necessary. Traditional historical scholarship, creative representations, commemorative observances, and paying homage to the physical memorial sites. But for me, at the heart of remembrance is the telling of the story, the personal testimonies from eyewitnesses in their voice. The way to ensure that these voices are not lost is to record, preserve, and give access to the stories of the Holocaust era. In our coming together tonight, we are acknowledging this crucial importance of remembrance and therefore of documenting the individual and collective memory still within our reach. The testimonies of those who survived interweave individual experience with historical reality, providing glimpses into the history of the Holocaust that cannot be obtained from documents or written records. The emergence of this extensive documentation contributes important dimensions to our understanding of the Holocaust and its impact on survivors. Some have said that we now live in an age of testimony. Eyewitness accounts from survivors of war, human rights violations, and other genocides fill our airwaves and our bookshelves. But this is a relatively recent phenomenon. The mandate to record these stories grew out of both the survivors' need to bear witness as well as society's need to acknowledge what happened. Oral history has come to play a pivotal role in educating ourselves and our communities about the Holocaust and genocide and about the social preconditions, experiences, and long-term consequences of war. Although there is controversy around the question of reliability of memory, it is nevertheless an integral part of the historical discourse. Our knowledge about the past is made up of not only what happened, but also how the event was experienced and remembered. Over the years, as we have learned from survivors, we have come to recognize the obligation to listen, document, and enable survivors to bear witness to what they have seen. But as I mentioned, this was not always the case. Immediately following the war, there was a period of relative silence. This was a time of considerable ambivalence, 
with both society and survivors struggling to come to terms with the unprecedented horrors of the Holocaust. Survivors were busy with the demands of adaptation to new lives and were often met by a societal reaction of disbelief, indifference, avoidance, and silence. Breaking the silence for all whose lives were forever changed by the Nazi regime, breaking the silence for all those who suffer oppression and persecution, is a crucial step in the transformation of what happened to them as individuals and in the transformation of historical knowledge into societal action. To break the silence is to break through the consequences of being silenced, to shatter the internalization of the oppressor's message. In my work and research, I have looked at what it means to tell one's story and how personal testimony is both a compelling tool for education and remembrance, as well as a significant experience for survivors themselves. Oral history is a method which has a unique capacity to give voice. It has an ability to capture stories that otherwise would be lost, but are especially meaningful and instructive. The very practice of taking oral histories turns people's lives into history, into stories that have the potential to help us recognize commonalities, bridge differences, and ensure continuity through generations. Holocaust testimony is unique in its junction of the private and the public, the internal and the external. By making one's private experience public, one's traumatic encounter can be given new meaning, transforming private shame into public dignity. Making the story public serves to condemn injustice and enable survivors to regain continuity and community. In the words of Elie Wiesel, to remember is to create links between past and present, between past and future. To remember is to affirm one's faith in humanity and to convey meaning on our fleeting endeavors. It is often a painful struggle for survivors to tell their stories, which they generally do out of a powerful sense of obligation. The majority of survivors that I interview express the importance of documenting their stories and putting them on record for future generations. The importance of their children and their children's children's knowing their story, as well as their fear that the Holocaust might be forgotten, denied, or distorted, has motivated survivors to action. Some believe that they survived in order to be a witness and tell the world and speak out against genocidal atrocities. In this process of fulfilling their obligation to memorialize those who perish and to leave a legacy for future generations, survivors find various ways in which to reconnect with the past in order to make sense of their lives. It is compelling to observe the way in which testimony can contain deep ambivalence and yet offer the potential for transformation and development of the self. It is an act which goes beyond witnessing only for the sake of reporting to others. The process of giving testimony can set in motion self-reflection and lead to an increased sense of empowerment. Despite the difficulty of the interview process, these personal narratives are unique in their capacity to engage the listener in emotions and occurrences. Emotion accompanies knowledge and texture is given to thoughts and images. This enables listeners to acknowledge the reality and relevance in the life story being told. When it further moves listeners to look within themselves and learn about their own lives, we're truly creating a usable past. 
As we live in an increasingly audiovisual culture, and as the technology has developed, oral testimonies are now commonly videotaped. As a medium with informative as well as performative properties, the videotaped testimonies intensify the immediacy of history as it comes alive in the expressiveness of one's face, the tone of voice, and the presence of the individual. Video testimony transforms the fleeting memory of an individual voice and face into retrievable information that can be archived. Its purpose into, is to ensure its own potential to communicate to future generations. By preserving the testimonies, we not only store the story, but we retain the promise of further transformation into knowledge. In this way, audiovisual testimony becomes a powerful resource to remember and to teach the next generations, not only about what happened, but also to give insights into the implications and meanings of the events. When we use oral histories as a teaching tool, we give students the opportunity to come face to face with one person's story. They appreciate the raw and candid nature of a primary source. They recognize the authenticity of hearing directly from an individual. And most importantly, they find themselves getting involved, feeling like they know the person they are watching. We often see in class discussions students referencing the interview they have watched with a sense of personal attachment, prefacing their comments with, my person said. One student from a course that I've helped develop at Santa Clara University gave this feedback. I feel connected to the people whose interviews I have watched and I feel like I am one of the few people who can now pass on their stories, even if just to my family and friends. I can bear witness to what they went through, even if no one can ever know exactly what it felt like. I can remind people when they need to remember. Learning from oral history is qualitatively different because of the opportunity for affective learning. The emotional aspect is clearly an essential addition to learning about the Holocaust. The interviews provide a clearer image of the impact of the events people experience because the listener can see and hear the emotional subtext. Students learn about the complexity of an emotional response and can see that the telling itself can be a reflection of the nature of the experience. As survivors relate their memories with varied degrees of detail and a wide range of showing or not showing their emotions, the students learn about the numerous ways of enduring life experiences. The power of oral history is in how it allows observers to witness living history and to become witnesses themselves. What does it mean for us to become witnesses? And what is our responsibility as we are touched by the voices of survivors? The term witness is often used to describe the one who speaks in the name of those who are no longer able to speak for themselves. As secondary witnesses, we have an obligation to remember and to carry and to take action to carry survivors' voices with us into the future. Here I call on the words of someone outside the arena of Holocaust study. That is James Baldwin. He says, history does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us. We are consciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. So what we do today about Holocaust remembrance, about 
how, how we embody the knowledge gained directly from survivors will affect generations to come. It is our active commitment that will ensure remembrance for future generations. Perry, I wanted to start uh, by asking you a question, um, which is what, what prompted you to uh, begin to tell your story and what prompted kind of the, the passion that you put into the telling of your story and, in, and who was the story for? Well, actually, I've been thinking about this. It's, it's rather funny because the truth is... <clears throat> For many, many years, I did not think of myself as a survivor. The concept just didn't, I didn't absorb it. I had never been in a concentration camp. My family, the one that's close to me, we were two years under Nazi occupation in the Netherlands, and we effected the most amazing escape, and ultimately wound up in the United States, and as I was, came here, I was 11 years old, and I had to struggle with all the things, learning a new language, absorbing the culture, going to high school, going to college, uh, getting my degrees, serving in the army, and I really never thought of myself. And the funny thing is, even in my first marriage, I don't think my wife ever really thought of me as a survivor. I mean, neither one of us thought of it that way. And then... One day, and I don't remember the exact circumstances of what caused it, I was giving a talk and I was telling people about what had happened to me and how we had escaped. And I said, well, I said, I guess technically you could think of me as a survivor. And they said to me, never mind technically, you are a survivor. And I said, well, but I've never been in a camp. I said, it doesn't matter. You have suffered two years under Nazi occupation and you managed this amazing escape, and you are now here, and you can consider yourself to be a survivor. And so from that moment on, I guess I took on the mantle, if you like, of survivorship. Uh, I've uh, spoken in many locales about this most amazing escape that we had. And of course, even though the story that I generally tell is a story that would probably make a great film, you know, but it has tragic aspects to it because uh, there were those of us who were lucky enough and smart enough to leave, and there were those of us, unfortunately, who were left behind. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that has always lain in my gut for a long time and I was not even aware of it until uh, 1968. Uh, I had been invited to, to give a talk in Warsaw, Poland. And uh, I visited my family that had state returned to Belgium. And uh, my uncle, who was one of the escapees with us, told us what had told me what had happened in the night that the decision was made to actually escape and to leave. And I had not known anything about it because what does a kid of 11 years old know? You know, not let into the family secrets, not let into the family discussion. And suddenly I became aware of, of the horrors that had accompanied it. 
I've written it up under what I call my family, Sophie's Choice. And it really relates to what happened to my grandmother. And that was that the decision to leave was made because my father's factory was taken over by a Dutch Nazi to whom it had been offered. And luckily for us, he was the biggest SOB that you could imagine. And he constantly threatened my father with his life. And so the family got together, uh, my grandmother, her four children, and their spouses, and the issue came up as how were we going to get out of there? Now you must understand that at the time that the decision was made, uh, nobody really knew of the death camps because the decision to kill all the Jews was made exactly either that month or the month after, uh, you know, I, I can't remember the name of the town. There was this conference that Himmler... Wannsee. Right, Wannsee, okay. Anyway, so we didn't know about that. But what we did know was that there were Jews were going to be sent to labor camps in Poland, and that we did know, and these labor camps were going to lead to very, very horrible lives. And the chances of being killed were there, but we didn't understand that there was going to be total annihilation. I'm not... Am I saying? Yeah? Okay. So... The family got together, and the question was, who was going to go? And then it became very clear that my grandmother could not be taken along, because even though she was in her mid-50s, she was very hard of hearing, and she only spoke Yiddish. She was diabetic. And how could we travel through 1,200 kilometers or 1,500 kilometers or whatever it took through German-occupied territory and speak Yiddish to her when we were going to fake it and play as if we were not Jewish, you know? So it was not possible. And at that point, my uncle Shmuel said, well, he said, if uh, my mother stays, somebody has to stay with her. And I volunteered to stay. So what happened is, the three daughters and their husbands and their two children, we ultimately were the ones who escaped, but my grandmother and Shmuel and his wife and three children were left in Holland, and ultimately they were killed. They died in Auschwitz. We didn't know about this, you know? We came to this country, my mother and my father and I, in November of 1942, through some amazing things. It would take me hours to talk about it, so <laughs> there be no sense about it. But we were not really aware of what had happened to the people who were left behind. We just knew that they had disappeared. And I personally did not become aware of it until 1981, when Malka, my wife, and I and our two children were in Jerusalem at Yad Vashem, and I wandered into the library by mistake. I didn't even know that I was there, and there were all these black-covered books, you know, uh, covering the walls, and I was standing at a desk, I'll never forget that, and there was a picture there with some kind of application, and it was clear that the person in the picture was dressed in the clothing of the 30s, you know? And so I said to the attendant, I said, uh, oh, I said, this must be the place where you have the records of the people who died in the Holocaust. And he said to me, no, only those records that we have. I said, oh, I said, well, what about the Netherlands? He said, well, 95% of, of the Dutch records are complete. So I said, okay, uh, how were they organized? He said, alphabetically. I said, well, my grandmother's last name was Chop, C-Z-O-P-P. -P. I said, how were the C's? Can I have a look at that? And he opened the, he got the book off the shelf, and there it was. Uh, I mean, she had died at Auschwitz, and you know, they kept perfect records. 
which was in a way a good thing for us because we wound up uh, killing the director of uh, Auschwitz because of it, because he, he had kept the record so well. And uh, there it was, Rosa Chop, born whatever date, 1894, died January 31st, 1942, uh, 43, uh, age such and such, etc. And I said, well, what about the rest of the family? And he took out one book after another. And I was able to, I wrote down the names and I wrote down the records. And the interesting thing is we had family in Tel Aviv with whom we were staying. And we went back to them and we said, you know that all these records exist? Because the truth of it is that we hadn't been able to uh, commemorate the yard sites of anyone because we didn't know what had happened. And they were there in Israel, and they had never gone to Yad Vashem to actually find out what had happened to, to the mother and, and, and the cousins and, and the uncles, and we found it by accident. Perry, can I, can I jump in for one second? Sure. I want to bring Susan into the conversation, um, and I, I wonder whether this might be a good place. Susan is someone who's done a great deal of oral history, and um, just as you were talking, Perry, about your relatives who hadn't gone to, to learn about it. I'm curious, Susan, from your experience, um, when, uh, when people decide to tell their story, what is it that prompts them to do it? What are the resistances to telling the story? And what are the, uh, the reasons that they decide this is the time I want to I wanna tell the story? And from the other side, from a younger generation, what prompts them to suddenly want to learn about what happened to their families? And I think I, I need to say that um, of the 10 oral histories I've done, three have been uh, Holocaust survivors. Um, so in general, and with each one of them, it has been their children who said, I want to know. The first one I did was of a Holocaust survivor who'd never really told his story. And we worked slowly. It, it was a two-year process. Of, of slowly taping and then transcribing and then editing it. Um, and since that time, that person has gone to schools. But w it took a while for him to tell. But so many of the books I've done, the introduction says, I'm doing this because my kids are making me. I'm doing this because my kids are asking. So it's both Holocaust and not. It is the kids wanting to know. Um, I think one of the difficulties or one of the greater issues is while everyone has had struggles in their lives, clearly Holocaust survivors, the pain of what has happened to them can make it very difficult for them to talk about it. They may want to answer the questions, but it, it, they, they're hurting. Um, and in fact, one person, I know that there is much more to his story then he told. And when I pushed, um, when I talked about it, he finally was able to say, there are other memories. I keep them in a box with a lock on them. When the lock gets loosened, I listen to opera. I call friends. I do something. My fear is that when I get older, I won't be able to keep the lock on. Um, he and I have a promise that I will listen if he ever wants to talk. But I hope for him that he keeps the lock on. Um, but again, it is, is the children pushing um, and wanting to know would be the biggest, biggest motivation. I, I wanted to um, bring into the conversation also the, the clip that we heard, which is such a, a, a extraordinary and affecting clip, and the, the idea of the father wanting to protect the daughter and the daughter wanting to learn. And it's such a beautiful kind of moment of those two things happening. And I'm wondering, Perry, whether you understand the, the father's desire to do that, to keep the story so well, that she doesn't have to enter that room. Does, does that make sense to you? Yes, it does, because my family, my parents, never spoke about that choice with regard to my grandmother. They never talked about it. I found out about it when I, uh, in 1968, which was uh, you know, uh, 24 years after the war was over. 
Uh, I had not known about it before, but so many things about it, our lives became very, very clear to me when that story was told to me because when we, after the war, uh, my parents, of course, tried to make a living in this country and they really couldn't. They were Europeans in, in, in mind and my father and mother constantly would go back to Holland in order to make a living and my mother kept running back. You know, she, my father would stay, my mother kept running back and I was really very angry with her that she did this. I felt that she was sabotaging him. And once I discovered what had happened, it suddenly, you know, became so clear to me, how could she walk the streets of The Hague knowing that she had made that decision with regard to her mother, to leave her mother there? And then, you know, how, how could she have done that? Uh, it must have been horrible, it must have been absolutely horrible. And the corollary to all of this is that Ultimately, I must tell you, the thing that I'm most proud of in my life was that at some point I recognized that there was no memorial to all the people in my family who were killed in the Shoah. And I got the cousins together who survived, and we put a plaque up at Yad Vashem for them, and we dedicated it. We had a dedication, which, by the way, is kind of funny because it had... This happened in 1996. It had never been done before at Yad Vashem, a dedication. You know, we had a, like a two-hour ceremony of prayer and poetry and music, uh, etc. And afterwards, we had a dinner for the family. And there were about 40 of us in this courtyard of this Kurdish restaurant in Jerusalem. And, you know, and I wrote this up because it was really strange. You know how it is. People get together at a dinner. There's noise, 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 noise. And all of a sudden, sometimes, there's silence. Now, there were two people there at that dinner. My mother and father were no longer with us. But the two younger aunts were there. Uh, they were now 78 and 80 each. And the younger one suddenly was saying, it was death quiet. And she was saying to her sister sitting in the corner, she said, and I was the youngest one there and I had nothing to do with the decision. And I looked around and I said to myself, and then of course the noise rose up again. And I looked around and I said to myself, anybody understand this besides me? You know, no, nobody had really understood it. I wasn't going to explain it to anyone, you know, uh, but it really hit me. It hit me like, you know, as if I were hit with a hammer. I felt it was so important that I ultimately wrote it up and uh, it appeared in, uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of uh, this uh, tabloid called Martyrdom and Resistance, which is written by uh, Holocaust survivors, and I felt it was an important story to be told, and they published it. But I'll never forget that, she said, and I was the youngest one there. And uh, obviously, there were eight people there, including my, in addition to my grandmother, when that decision was made. And... The only thing that I could say with grace about it was that the people who made the decision really did not know that whoever was going to be left there was really going to be killed. I mean, that was something that came afterwards. But the strangest thing about it is we never talked about it in our home. Never. Never. All the things that I discovered about it, I discovered myself. And... It happened not when I was young. It happened when I got to be in my 40s. When I was young, I was just too busy, you know, going to school, learning, trying to get a degree, making a living, etc. And then suddenly one day it dawned on me and said, hey, you know, you got to find out about what these things are. And so from my viewpoint, I told my story to the Spielberg Foundation. And of course, they ultimately sent me the videotapes that they had videographed, and I made copies of it for my children. And I said to myself, you know, this is my duty to them. And that's it. And the further thing is, at that, at that ceremony of the dedication, our son videotaped it, and we also sent that to everybody in the family. So at least we have a record of that. I know Anne and Susan, I think, both wanted to, so. Yeah, um, well, 
the dynamics, I think, are, are so interesting uh, within the family. You were saying often the children are those who want to know or the, or the parents don't want to talk about their experiences. And I think often what happens is that both are protecting each other um, and that we see a change often only with the appearance of a third generation, that when there are grandchildren on the scene, all of a sudden the, the, the grandparents may speak more to them or may realize that they must tell. Um, and uh, the, the children themselves often are protecting their parents, not wanting to cause them pain to talk about it. And so I think it's a, it's a two-way street. You didn't ask, they didn't tell, because um, it's, it's so difficult to touch on. Susan. Well, and what, what I was going to remark on was the opening of the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Skokie um, this past week. And a lot of the articles talking about it said that there had, was going to be a neo-Nazi march and there was a protest and, and it was stopped. And prior to that, and in my childhood, I don't remember much being said about the Holocaust. People were quiet. And it was apparently after this that people started to say, we need to tell our story. So that the timing in terms of what has gone on historically, it began and then slowly it, it took on. Um, and, but I think you're right about the mutual protecting. You know, the, the, one of the people I worked with didn't, wanted his children to have as normal a childhood as possible and did not want to put his pain on them. Um, and, and yet they wanted to know, they knew parts of what happened. Um, but he waited until they were closer to adulthood. I think that there's another aspect that we should consider, and that is the American soldiers who found the camps and who then came back and they didn't talk about it either. And uh, I had, I had cousins who had served and who had been, and nobody talked about what they had found and what they had seen. Uh, the first time that I actually heard someone talk about it was a story that I told at dinner time. Uh, we were living in LA, uh, Mark and I, and uh, I gave a talk about our amazing escape. And I get a telephone call the next day from someone who had been there. And he said, I really want to talk to you. And uh, I didn't know who he was, but we met for lunch, and he told me that he had been an American soldier who had chanced with his uh, company on one of the death camps in Germany. And uh, the commanding officer, they were confronted with hundreds and hundreds of corpses just lying in the field. And so the commanding officer decided that there was only one thing to do, he took the company into the town that was nearby, and they picked up every German male that they could, and they forced them to go back to the camp to bury the corpses. And the American soldiers stood guard over what was happening. And he told me that, it was, of course, you know, to do this, obviously, was a terrific cost to the Germans who, who were doing it, and two of them couldn't stand it. And they ran away. And he was standing there, and he took his rifle, and he shot them. He killed them. He was never court-martialed for it. But he never told anybody that he had done that either. I was the first one he told it to. And he said, you know, he said, it's been lying in my gut for all these years, and I, 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 I can't believe that I actually did this. I, I, I feel that I need to be forgiven. And I said, well, I said, I'll tell you. Given my life and the adventures that I had with regard to my family, etc., I forgive you. <laughs> One of the things that I want to talk about, or what I think is an issue of, of um, significance, and and you talked about it in your your remarks, is um, the idea of the power of the of the videotape. And as we move into the 21st century, and there are we are and will be fewer survivors, the kind of the electronic media and the videotape. Uh, of the oral histories will take the place of the oral histories themselves. And there is this enormous effective and performative aspect to it that is 
um, so rich and interesting, yet it is not the same as actually having someone in the room talking to you. And I'm just wondering, just from the point of view of, you know, an educational point of view or a pedagogical point of view, um, what that means. Um, what what is what might the difference be in terms of how the stories are transmitted to the next generation without having actually the people in the room? Well, I, I think obviously there is nothing like personal testimony to hear it from them. Um, but but the next uh, once removed uh, experience will be the videotaped oral histories. Um, and though it's not the same, I think that it is something that... Um, we can take in and uh, interpret in a very live way, um, as, as I said, that, that people um, who listen and watch the testimonies um, can uh, create meaning for themselves from what they've learned and that that's what they will carry on. So there, there's certainly a, a process um, or I might even say interpretation. Um, it's not the same, but I think that it, it will be carried on. And, and the message so often is, is much beyond um, the facts of the Holocaust, but about life itself, uh, about values. Uh, students so often um, listen and watch these tapes and are most affected by how this person lived their life and um, was uh, able to cope with these tremendous obstacles. And they take that and they make use of that in their lives. So in, in that way, uh, I think there's still a, a great, great power in that. Um, I, what you're reminding me of, the urban school, uh, an independent high school here, has an oral history project that I helped initially train the teachers in how to do oral histories and they train the students. And what is wonderful about when they have interviewed Holocaust survivors is that it is a multicultural group doing the interviewing. So that there are African American and Hispanic students doing the interviewing and it's a different kind of conversation and it's an opening up of um, a greater understanding and a broadening the, the questions. And the first two years they did Holocaust survivors and they also interviewed um, liberators one year um, and have gone on. But one of the questions which I, I shared with Dan in terms of videotaping and having it online or whatever is that years ago when it was the 25th anniversary of the man walking on the moon, I was all excited, right? And one of my daughter's High school friend said, I don't believe it ever happened. And I said, yes, you know, I saw it on television. Duh. And she said, special effects. <laughs> okay. My concern with all the movies, with all the videos, with all the acting, is that as poignant and as powerful as the videotapes are, that people will look and say they're actors. And, and that is just, I don't know how, what we can do about it, but that is a, a real concern of mine. Um, I, this might be a good time just to open it up for some questions. Um, I'm not too good with counting, but I think we have five mics and therefore one can be passed around. And since we are videotaping this, please talk into the mic so we can capture your question. Hi. Um, that very question I've been wrestling with, uh, in fact, today, in fact, walking up here today, I was thinking about exactly that. And I was wondering, have you come up with any answers to that? It, it, it's, you know, we live in this age of distortion. You can do anything in Photoshop. The, we, there's this whole body of scholarship now that claims that the, that the, the Holocaust never occurred. And they can easily prove it because they can point to this whole body of scholarship, which points to this whole body of scholarship, which points, you know, which eventually was this, at some point was this distortion, but it's so many citations removed now 
that those that write it and those that read it can actually prove among themselves that it never occurred. So it, it, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. My father is a survivor as well. And, and, and the, 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 the fear that anything that I record of his story is someday going to be dismissed in the way that it already is being by so many people today. I mean, have you come up with any answer to that question? No, I have the question. I, uh, and the concern and the real fear. Um, I, I don't know how you can prove that what you see in a video is real. I think it's really not very different from the fact that uh, there's a whole class of people who believe that uh, Adam and Eve watched the dinosaurs, you know, and... Uh, we didn't get no, that on videotape, though. No, but, <laughs> but they believe that, and, uh, and uh, they have no idea, for example, of the marvelous uh, wall paintings that Cro-Magnon Man uh, did in, in the southern part of France, and uh, you have to see it, I mean, to, to really believe it. So what happens is, I think there are whole vistas of knowledge that unless you read and believe and study and maybe visit or talk to the scholars who know about it, that there are a whole class of people who won't believe it, who won't believe it. Uh, I mean, I know what happened to my family. Okay, I know they're no more, right? And uh, when I go to uh, Yad Vashem <clears throat> and I see all the names, okay, I, I recognize, yes, uh, these were the people who were, lived across the street from us. And uh, they died in Maidanek or they died in Sobibor, et cetera. So I know it happened, all right? Uh, but there's always going to be people who still believe the world is flat. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's nothing we can do about that. that. That's the kind of ignorance that's just going to pervade our society as, as long as our society exists. And did you have a, an answer to that too? Well, um, no good answers, unfortunately. But I think there are things on the one hand that we can do to um, make the context important and attach let's say, the video testimonies to the larger body of knowledge and documentation. So there are some ways we can do that. But it brings up other questions about how we give public access to this information and how much can we safeguard and then how much do we give up in terms of giving access, uh, letting people know, um, opening the material up to people, um, while at the same time having some safeguards in place. So these are very real dilemmas that we are dealing with in many ways. Um, and it would be interesting to hear, but uh, I, I think attaching it to the context and also in its source, um, preserving it in very careful uh, ways with good records is, you know, we do the best that we can do to um, ensure that the correct information is being carried forward. Thanks. Thanks Thank for your you. question. I would just like to add something to that, if you forgive me. Uh, when I was interviewed by the people in the Spielberg Foundation for my story, what I really liked about it was, in the beginning, the first thing they asked me is, describe what Jewish life was like in The Hague before the war, okay? What was it really like? And so the first 10 or 15 minutes really dealt with what our family life was like, the synagogues we went to, the community such as it was. Uh, it was really a tripartite community in, uh, in Holland. Uh, there were the original Spanish-Portuguese uh, refugees who came to Holland in the 16th century. Then there were the Ashkenazic Jews who came to Holland in the 19th century. Then there were the Eastern European Jews who came in the 20th century. And they wanted to know about all this. So this sort of set the context of what really happened. And then they started to say to me, okay, now tell me what happened when Hitler invaded Holland and how did you react, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought, the only thing that I think is wrong with that is that the average person doesn't really have access to this. I mean, 
all these tapes, et cetera, are now at the University of Southern California, okay, that's people, and they're for scholars. And if you or I wanted to go and we could do it if we went there, but I suspect that if we wrote to them and said, hey, I'd like to have the history of so-and-so and so-and-so, I doubt whether we'd be able to get our hands on it. And I wonder if I could ask, I don't know the specifics of this issue with the videotapes at, at USC, but in terms of videotapes and other kind of electronic or digital information being available, um, what is that like at your institution and other institutions today, and has that changed at all in the last few years? Um, it has, and it's ever-evolving, really, um, with the advent of digitization and easier access to digitization. It's still a huge... Uh, uh, arena with um, with no set standards yet, um, but um, technical standards or standards of technical okay. standards. Yes, yes. Um, so, uh, what, for instance, is to be made available online? Um, that's that's a big question. That's something that we're grappling with. We give access, um, if, if someone wants to come in uh, to view a tape, or in some cases, if someone's doing research, we will loan out uh, tapes. We do have um, certain guidelines and, and um, uh, terms of use that someone needs to agree to so that we have some uh, minimal... Uh, uh, request of, you know, and knowledge of how this will be used. Um, but as you make thing, uh, the information more available online, the questions get uh, and the issues get much more difficult about how much you make uh, available online, in what forms. Um, it is the best way to reach people. It is what people want to have in order to really use the information. And so we're looking at how to do that in a way that is sensitive to the material. Um, I think there were a question, uh, a lot of questions. I'm going to take the risk of uh, offending my husband here because he probably would say nothing. But, um, he didn't see himself as a survivor either until two nights ago when we were at a Yom HaShoah uh, memorial ceremony in Foster City. And as we walked in and somebody asked, are you a survivor? And he said, no, I left at such and such a time and, and started to tell a little bit. And she said, you are a survivor, pinned a ribbon on him. And he marched down the synagogue aisle with a candle. And this is the first time he ever thought of himself as a survivor. But his story was very similar to Perry's simil uh, uh, story, leaving behind not just his grandfather, with whom they had lived, but leaving behind 22 members of the family. And of those 22, only two survived Auschwitz. Uh, they w this was Czechoslovakia. And as he says, I never thought of myself so much as a Jew until my identity was defined by others. The others determined that now when you ask him what he is, he sees himself primarily as a Jew, and we live in Israel. We have a small condo here, and we come to visit children here. But uh, in Israel, there is also in a kibbutz, a Givat Chaim, a complete record of Czechoslovakian Jewry, and we were able to find the records of exactly when his grandfather was picked up, from what street address, on what day, when he went to uh, Theresienstadt, when he was transported from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz, and the same for all the other members of the family. But um, it's apparently a story that's not that unusual, and how they escaped and made it to a kind of a wandering Jew existence because from Czechoslovakia getting through Europe to England, uh, having to change languages, he had started in German in the Sudetenland. He then learned Czech. Then he had to go to school in England. And by the time he was 11 or 12, had gotten to Chile after 31 days on a boat across the ocean and started in Spanish. And so with his fifth language being English, I hope he forgives me for telling a little bit about what happened to him and and 
that that story is another one that should be told. And when we get home, I'm going to insist he continue with his writing, which he started and has never finished, of the story of what happened, uh, including leaving friends behind and so on. Well, can, can I make a suggestion? If you don't want to write it, just get a tape recorder and talk into it. Get a tape recorder and talk into it. Pretend you're telling whoever you want to tell. Well, and that may be easier than writing it. Don't worry about editing, just talk. Actually, I have a better idea, okay. and that is <laughs> talk to me afterwards. I'm very glad to see you, and I was, uh, uh, saw you in Foster City as well. And we'll set up an appointment, and we'll do an oral history. I think that whatever I can tell will really not describe the horror of the Holocaust. In order to describe the horror of the Holocaust, we need the testimony of somebody who lived in Theresienstadt, who lived in Auschwitz, who was a survivor, which are the two persons of, the fam of my family who survived and came finally to mm -hmm. Israel. And uh, they have a story in Israel also. I have also letters from the, my aunt who survived a letter which was written months after she was in a uh, Russian, in a Russian camp. She was saved by the Russians, and she describes in detail their suffering in the concentration camp. I think these types of testimony will can also uh, defeat any uh, Holocaust uh, denier. Because what I lived will not defeat the Holocaust denier. I lived the normal life after having abandoned Czechoslovakia. What I would just like to respond, though, to you, and that is um, I, I hear this oftentimes from people. and. Uh, a, the definition of Holocaust survivor is broader than you might think. It really is anyone who was targeted for death by the Nazi regime, anyone who was persecuted or discriminated against in the years between 1933 and 1945. So if, if you lived under Nazi regime, your life was changed forever because of that. We want to learn as much as possible about that whole era it is not, it, very important, the camp experiences, but it's just as important to hear all the experiences of others to know what, what, they, what happened to them. There are so many different kinds of experiences and to know what happened early on, to understand, to try to learn about the indications of the, the regime that was coming and what happened. So I, I think we have a lot to learn from you and your own experience, and, and that is what we'd like to do. I think I can, what I can do, I can send you, first of all, the testimony of my relative who survived really Auschwitz and who describes in detail the sufferings in Auschwitz and the, the life in Auschwitz. And also, I can talk to you about her daughter. He, about your life. Israel, and yeah. finally, I, can, I, can, I can't say anything. I, cannot, I could not say anything which really would convince a Holocaust. I we'll just, talk. I just want to mention <laughs> one thing. He, he, we, um, he went to visit a 93-year-old cousin in Toronto that... Um, by, uh, that he, his mother's cousin, and he mentioned, do you happen to know, and he gave the name of his best friend, his childhood friend, and he said, I heard that somehow he survived and he's in Canada. And the cousin said to him, I play poker with him. And he picked up the phone and called, and within 15 minutes, this is just about four years ago, this man walked into the house carrying a photograph. It was their second grade photograph, the class picture, from the German school that they went to before they went to the Czech school. And around the margin, he had written, 
my husband's name and said, this is my best friend. And he said to him, I've been angry at you for 60 years. And Peter said, why? He said, do you remember our last night together? They had gone to a youth group meeting and they were coming back and they stood in front of a toy store and were looking at things and picking out what they would like. And then they each said goodbye, see you tomorrow and went home. He came home and his father had managed to get the tickets to get on a train to get out of there. And he, they, they, he got the family out within 15 minutes. They got on a train and left. His friend said to him, you never said goodbye. You didn't trust me. You didn't tell me. The friend went, ended up in Auschwitz and lost his mother, his, his father, and his sister. And he came back to the town and waited for five years, hoping that one of them would come back and harboring his anger. Now, he just called us a week ago saying he's coming on the March of the Living and he'll be in Israel could he come to see us? And we were here at this time. So we, but we, we have connected again. But I mean, he thinks he has no stories. He has many. I'm, I'm the child of two survivors. And my legacy brought me to the Shoah Foundation Project as an interviewer. And being trained to do the kind of interviews you were talking about involved a pre-interview where we gathered notes and then we went home and we did research from history books. And our goal was to um, keep the oral testimony of the witness, of the person who lived in the experience, as close to what's documented in history. And those tapes have been cataloged. There's over 50,000 of them but they've been cataloged and they're now in five repositories. Not all of them are done yet. But I think that one of the steps we have to take is to get your um, interviews that you're doing with Oral History Project and the Holocaust Center's work and all the documents into the, um, this may sound odd, but into the places in Poland and Germany that are preserved, that are camps where th these things happened. And perhaps those places can become repositories of that history so we can get even one step closer to, to the reality of what happened there. And, and hopefully we can battle those deniers. Well, I, I think we now have the power to actually have all those things I don't know whether we're doing it yet, but we have the power to get it all on the internet so that anyone could really have access to it. It shouldn't just be sitting in a library. It shouldn't just be uh, accessible to the scholars who are trying to study it. It should be accessible to everyone, okay? Uh, maybe the equivalent of Wikipedia, you know? Uh, so that uh, if I want to know what happened to my great uncle who uh, died uh, in uh, Majdanek, Okay, uh, I could go to the internet and put his name in there and it'll tell me and it'll tell me his story, et cetera, et cetera. But and I think that is something that we really have to work for so that we all have access to it. That's what we need because one of the things that, that's so strange is the following. Children are not interested. They're too busy working, worrying about their own lives. There gets to be a point in your life when suddenly it dawns on you, hey, what happened to my dad? What happened to my uncle? What happened to my cousins? Where did they come from? What did they do, etc." And sometimes, you know, to do that search is, is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, I can tell you, as I said, we had that dedication at Yad Vashem, and I was talking to one of my cousins whose father had been killed by the Nazis, and he said, well, he said, I know. He said, he was killed in Auschwitz. And I said, really? I said, how do you know that? He said, well, I just know it. I said, okay. Next day, I went to the library at Yad Vashem. He had been in France. He had been captured in France. He wound up in Drancy and then was shipped to Majdanek, not to Auschwitz. And 
those of us who know about what happened to Majdanek, less than 1% of the people who wound up in Majdanek survived. But I found his name on the roster of the train that left from my that left from uh, Drancy to go to Majdanek. Okay, but the sons never knew that. You know, they just took it for granted. Okay, so we we shouldn't be in a position where we have to do that special research. It should be available to all of us. And somehow or other, I think. That's one of the things, I hate to say this, but I think that's one of the things where the Shoah Foundation has not yet really done its job. It should make itself available on the internet, okay? If, if I want to find out about a movie or who won an Oscar in 1937, you know, I go to the internet and I find it out trivially. And we should be able to do that. That's part of our modern technology. We need it. Um, one thing I think that uh, we're forgetting that is definitely in favor of um, those people who fight to um, set the record straight and um, deny the deniers is that the Germans did keep such meticulous, wonderful records and that the Poles are now coming to grips with their history and there's been all sorts of research done by Polish historians who are not Jewish um, about what happened. Um, and that within um, Nazi Germany and Nazi occupied Europe, um, you know, 60 years later, that there uh, amongst the, um, the, the general population and the educated um, communities, um, denial is uh, is frowned upon and is perse is um, prosecuted. And as long as um, that continues, I think uh, it it goes a long way in um, keeping the historical record accurate. Plus, um, Deborah Lipstadt's historic trial, uh, where she um, just through the historical record, not through eyewitness testimony, um, was able to um, prove in court that um, the lies that David Irving told um, were lies and that uh, history proved that the Holocaust did happen. Thank you. Um, actually, building on uh, that, uh, Deborah Lipstadt did speak at the Holocaust Center a year or two ago, and and as an expert on denial, Holocaust denial, she says that it's the new form of anti-Semitism. And so if you fight Holocaust denial the same way you fight anti-Semitism, my question is, how would you use the oral histories to accomplish that that fight? That's probably one of the toughest questions one could answer because I think people who are prejudiced in that direction, okay, even if they're confronted with the truth, they're not going to believe it. They're going to deny it, all right? So it's, uh, it, it's, it's an issue that relates to how deeply anti-Semitic you are, okay? I mean, you know, someone once pointed out that... Uh, on any specific issue that you can think of, like anti-Semitism or like the Holocaust, there would be perhaps 10% people who would be in favor and 10% of the people who would be against and 80% would be in the middle, you know, and they could be swayed either way. But the 10% that are against, you're never going to sway them, okay? I don't care what data you provide. They're going to tell you it's fiction, all right? And because that's their nature. That's what they believe. That's 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 as part of them as their own flesh and blood. Actually, I uh, disagree. I think that oral history testimony is just the antidote, because facts and figures is not going to speak to someone who's grown up with certain ideas and thinks a certain way about certain people. But when they get to know 
one person and to hear their experience and what they went through, I think that's when we can cross those barriers. Um, and I think that uh, that's what can break through stereotypes. That, oh, this person you know, was my age when he did this, or they talk about something. Um, sometimes you had young uh, Jewish, uh, uh, particularly boys, who um, joined the Hitler Youth Movement or wanted to join the Hitler Youth Movement because that's what was appealing to the, the young boys at the time. Um, and, and that's what all their peers were doing. So to understand all of a sudden that they would have been caught up in something that they didn't understand and didn't know that it was hateful of themselves, that someone can start to relate to that personal story. Um, so I, I, I think, um, uh, of course, it's not easy, but... Uh, there's yeah, I would agree with Anne. And in fact, um, one of the people whose oral history I did routinely goes to the East Bay to speak at Bishop O'Dowell Catholic School. And he does this twice a year and has saved all the letters from the kids. And it is a population that does, is, is learning but has not known. And he says the letters are incredible because this is a real person telling a real story and the kids feel it. Yeah, they right. feel it and they believe it. But what I think you're talking about is that 80% in the middle. You know, they're the people that can be swayed this kind of material, and they'll believe it. Well, no, I think I, the 10% the, the at the edge, I don't think you're really ever going to get to them. I, I, I'm a firm believer in that. Because you take just about any scientific theory that we know about. Think, think, think of the, how crazy these people still are about fighting the concept of evolution. Okay, uh, There's just no way to convince them. They have no concept uh, of carbon dating, etc. They have no concept of science. They just love their own ignorance, and they're stuck with it, okay? And uh, per, that's the way it is. You're never going to get to that 10%. I'm sorry. I, I am a firm believer in that. I, I've been teaching mathematics for uh, 40 years, and I know about that 10%. Believe me. You, you know what? But, but I'll give up the 10%. If we get the 80%, if we can take the people in the middle who aren't sure and have a solid back, you know, support of them, they can counteract the 10%. Well, I'm not, I'm not yeah. disputing that, but the problem is that that 10% that we're talking about, they are so hardened in their beliefs and try to push whatever they can with, with all their power that they can still take some of the people in the 80% and make them believe what they believe. Okay? They do that. This is unfortunate. I think you're right that they are hardened and swaying them was obviously very difficult. Uh, but I'm wondering if swaying them with the horrible atrocities like Auschwitz is what they want to say is not true. Maybe it's your story that will get through to them. Maybe it's the stories of those who think that they're not survivors, even though you survived, you were there. And and that's the story that someone who can't handle the atrocities of Auschwitz and says that's not true. Your story is the one that they can't argue against. You survived, you were there, and that's why we need to hear from you. I think one of the things that has not been mentioned enough, in my opinion, is the difference between the Holocaust and the genocide. There have been a lot of genocides after the war. There have been genocides before the war. The Russians, the communists killed more people, which can be called a genocide. But it was not the Holocaust. The characteristic of the Holocaust, now that we know details of the Holocaust, is that the only objective of the killing was the killing itself. It was an attempt to liquidate a whole nation. And that has not happened in other cases. That's what makes the Holocaust a unique experience, in my opinion. 
Um, this is about the time for us to stop our discussion. I want to thank our speakers very much and everyone for coming tonight. Um, and to encourage all of us to keep talking and to keep listening. Um, and uh, if you want to, we'll be, museum will be open for a few more minutes, not the galleries, but, uh, but the store. Um, and there's information both about the, um, the Holocaust Center's oral history project and the story core that is here. And uh, I and my colleagues at the museum are around to ask, answer any questions you have. So thank you very much. <laughs>